Welcome to the Vintage Vibe. And tonight we're going to take a look at Sony's STR V5, little brother to the V6 and V7. And when you look inside this thing, you're going to swear it should have been called the V8. Monster receiver and pure vintage muscle. And if cars like this grace the streets, then this is what graced the audio stores in the late 70s. In the 70s, it was all about excess. Bigger was better. And this was, well, almost just about as big as they got, weighing about 40 pounds and, well, not fitting on your average audio stand. But it didn't matter, because in the 70s, you put this thing on the floor, you put it on top of your TV, you, you put it anywhere. Style? Well, I mean, think about it. A car with a big bird on it. The perception of style and what people thought was cool was a little different than today. But I think that's what makes vintage audio cool today. The bigger, the uglier, the better. And I've had just about them all. It all started back here in about 74 with Pioneer's SX1010, the first 100 watt receiver and the equivalent of about a $3,200 purchase today. And uh, this is kind of where the monster receiver wars began. It didn't take too long for receivers to clip over 160 watts per channel. I've had a couple of these G9000s, the 8000s, as well as the bigger brothers, the G22000s. Um, I mean, they're backbreakers. And you can't talk monster receivers without talking about the fantastically successful Pioneer SX1250, 1280, and 1980 series receivers. I've had, well, one of each of them, and uh, they truly are, uh, for some, the pinnacle of a monster receiver. This is probably about as big as they got. It was Techniques SA-1000. I've had one of these, and let me tell you, well, if you put a cushion on it, you could probably use it as a Chesterfield. And at over 90 pounds and 300 watts per channel, it was probably the most powerful single chassis receiver ever built. Unfortunately, as the 70s were winding down, Sony came out with the STR V5, 6, and 7, and they thought this is where, well, styling was going to go. And for whatever reason, they weren't the most popular, and they never really did kind of earn that monster receiver status. Um, but they definitely are, especially when you look at one of these things when you got the top off, which we're just about to do, they truly are a monster receiver. So we put it on the bench, we took the lid off and pulled all the jewelry off and got it ready for a service. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. Well, comments here as I uh, venture into servicing this unit. It really caught me by surprise being the STR V5, the smaller brother to the six and the seven. I didn't expect to see a power transformer, quite frankly, this large out of an 80 watt per channel receiver. I mean, if you've ever seen the Pioneer SX1250, this transformer, this Tatalderal transformer, is nearly as, just as big. And uh, that receiver is 165 watts per channel. Now, obviously a little difference between the two are the filter capacitors. They're not as large, but the attention to detail there with copper bus bars, that's, that's pretty impressive. And everything's logically laid out, kind of expected, uh, you know, it's all where you expect it to be. For example, on the back of this power supply board, everything's labeled. So if you do go to service it or recap it, you can kind of find your way around the unit. Now these heat sinks I think are kind of neat, um, the way they designed them to keep them in the receiver, to not have to put them around the sides or the back like the Pioneer. They're about five inches deep and you got the left and the right channel with the driver boards inserted in the middle. Now this part's a little awkward, we'll talk about this when it comes to servicing in a little bit. And the um, tuner board here, you've got some low pass filters in line here you can see the capacitors resistors all that fun stuff but right here you got a five gang fm tuner um, which again is a nice feature on this unit here all in all i think it's a really well built unit i'll make some comments on how it sounds a little bit later on but if you've ever seen the sansui g9000 or the pioneer sx 1250 this is every bit a monster receiver as one of those Maybe just not with the big high price tag. And for whatever reason, it wasn't as popular. But definitely at this point, at least when it comes to build quality, I'm quite impressed. Little Nat King Cole. So it plays quite well, um, but it wasn't that easy to get this thing to actually play. Let me go a little deeper for you. Here's part one of some service comments. 
little service note here. If you do have a channel cutting in and out on this receiver, it's likely this relay you can see right here nestled between the big heat sinks. The problem with this receiver though is the way Sony designed it, it really wasn't meant to uh, easily service. Now what you have to do is unbolt these heat sinks and remove the screws for this heat sink here that's adjacent to the power transformer and this half of an inch gap will allow you just enough room to move this heat sink over and pull the top off as you can see I've already done here of that relay and then service it. Now I'll take care of your cutting out channel. Now if you do have a problem with the meters, um, I've seen a few comments about the meters not working properly. Likely what's causing that, if you follow the wires, this is the board here for the meters and there is one capacitor right here which I've already removed and it's replacements over here that we're going to install. That likely is the cause and the solution. Um, another thing here, the lights are quite easy to get at. They're 6 volt. You just snip them, replace them with something suitable. Um, all in all, it looks like a fairly easy receiver to service, except for, obviously, how tight some of the, um, the pieces are in here. I got pretty good at taking it apart. I had to a couple times, uh, because when I did address that relay, it wasn't long after that the other channel ended up uh, failing on me. So out that relay came again, and we gave it another cleaning with a little bit more aggressive of a paper. And uh, well, in hindsight, my suggestion would be probably splurge and buy a new relay, because you don't want to have to take this thing apart time and time again. And remember that signal board? Well, that's only one of two. The other board is actually on the tone board, and that controls the left meter, which after capping this, the right worked fine, but the left, well, she wasn't working. So back the board went in, and after a little bit of dissection of the schematics, I found these two trim pots here, which are RT401 and 414. And after a little shot of deoxid and uh, some wiggling, well, both meters, they worked. Uh, unfortunately, what led up to this point, as you might be able to see, is about four caps I replaced on that signal board. I'd like to believe that uh, that did the trick and they just needed a cleaning, but I guess I'll never know. And the more research I did, it seemed to be a common problem that the Sony has with the meters. So first place you go is those trim pots, give them a little shot of deoxid, give them a little wiggle, mark them first, mark them with maybe some paint or something so you can get them back in position, and that will likely cure your meters. But this bulb, well, if your stereo beacon light's not working, it may not be the bulb. I probably should have checked for voltage first, but I didn't, and uh, it seemed to be a bigger problem. But I took a little break from that to maintain my sanity and I set the bias. And this one is pretty easy to set the bias on. You've got a positive lead from your digital multimeter to your positive speaker output. And your negative lead will actually go to a little terminal that's on the top of those driver boards. One for left channel and then when you do the other side, one for right channel. And you set it at 10 millivolts. Now mine was about 50 millivolts when I tested it. Not horrible, but... You know what, it was really easy to adjust and it should be a little extra step if you know your way around a multimeter and you can read a manual, then uh, you'll do just fine. So I dove a little deeper back into that tuner problem because what I was also noticing, aside from the beacon light, is that when I would toggle the stereo mono switch, this little guy right here, I wasn't noticing any difference in stereo separation. Now, right now, I can hear the stereo switch activating, um, but it took a little adjustment to get it to do that. And I will say it's, uh, it's sometimes subtle, so there's probably a little bit more alignment and work required uh, to get this tuner just right. I went back to the tuner board and I made marks at uh, various trim pods. This is the stereo separation trim pod, RT204 on the tuner board, easy to find. Give that a shot of deoxid, again mark it like I did here, give it a little wiggle. In a lot of instances, owners have reported that beacon light will, well, come back on in stereo, voila. And keep in mind, even though you've marked these, there is no guarantee you're going to get things back to the original position without the proper equipment, and you might make things actually worse.
And a safety note, there's various voltages on these boards and you don't want to zap yourself. So I kind of sort of gave up on that, but I decided since I was in there, I was going to take some time and try to align the tuner and to bring that dial back where it should be. So this is the tuning capacitor and on the far left hand side, that little nut, that's actually the trimmer and you could turn it to the left or the right. Now before you do that, first of all, mark currently where it is. Um, behind that trimmer, there's a little contact point and it tends to get oxidized and uh, that doesn't help with reception. So you get a little shot of deoxid and uh, then what you can do is to attempt to align your tuner. So now you'll pick your favorite station, let's say 91.1 right there. And if your tuner is out of alignment, this is kind of sort of what it should sound like. Instead of like this. So essentially what's happened is your tuner has gone out of alignment. And what we want to do is bring that back into range. So you've now selected 91.1 or whatever your station is on your dial. And you'll turn that trimmer until you hear it first and foremost come in nice and crystal clear. And then you can look down at your tuning dial. And where it's the strongest, this needle should be dead center in the middle. And that signal switch we spoke about, that should be at the highest for signal. Uh, in this case, it's three and a half, let's say. And again, your knob should correspond or your dial should correspond to your favorite station. And you've basically done a poor man's alignment. Now I should note that the tuning gangs on this were quite dirty. So what I did end up doing was I took a contact cleaner, a non-residue contact cleaner, very important, you don't want oily residue uh, on your tuning capacitor, and I flushed those fins that you can see there and took a pipe cleaner that was also soaked in contact cleaner and gently worked it in between those fins, removing the oxidization and kind of the yellowy green film I was finding. Now remember, this is part of the antenna for your receiver. This would be like having a string on a guitar that was too loose or too tight and uh, just didn't sound right because it wasn't in tune. And it takes some time and you want to make sure you don't damage or, or move anything around in that area as you're working. But um, in this case, it made a marked improvement in the performance of the FM tuner. There is something so cool about this Sony. I think it's a combination between all the chrome, the brushed aluminum, and that fantastic green glow of the dials. Let's take it for a quick test drive. As you'd expect, speaker selectors for A and B, your low and high filters, tone controls, loudness, stereo mono switch, your uh, function switches, tape monitor, which was a big deal back then, and FM muting. Up top, those pesky little power meters. Tuning, volume, uh, and this little guy right here, this meter switch. When we switch that, what it actually does, it's a dual function. It goes from wattage reading to actual signal strength of your tuner, which I think is pretty cool. You know, it is a good sounding receiver. Um, the imaging, it's not that it is wider than anything else I've heard, but it definitely is taller. Um, it's got a, a good presentation, pretty decent bottom end, a nice mid-range, high frequencies are just where they should be. Horns sound nice. You hear the rim shot of the drums. All in all, it's a pretty impressive receiver for being 80 watts per channel. All in all, to me, the Sony STR V5 embodies the 1970s and true monster receivers. You can expect to pay upwards of three, four, as much as $500 now for one of these. 
It has the looks of the 6 and the 7 without the price tag. Plenty of power for your average system. And all in all, pretty darn good sounding. I definitely rank this as a yay for a vintage audio collection where you certainly don't have to break the bank. Thanks for joining us today on the Vintage Vibe.